at Magnify, our mission during this special week before Easter is to help us all feel a little holier by strengthening our relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I both know as women, we can be powerful forces for good in being witnesses of the Savior in our everyday lives. We can look to Mary Magdalene, the first witness of the resurrection, and a woman as an example. We think today's special interview will be time well spent. We are women who love God and want to use our influence for good. No matter how ordinary we may feel, we each have a powerful purpose in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our time to step forward, to love fiercely, to lead boldly, to live happily, to fill the world with his light. Let's do it together on the Magnify podcast. Joining me in today's conversation is Janice Johnson. Janice is a production manager at Desert Book and an adjunct BYU religion professor. Janice has studied out the life of Mary Magdalene. And she says this about Mary, the very first person to see Jesus after his resurrection. Understanding Mary's name begins to help us see her power and her central role. She is a tower of strength, the toweress or the magnified one. Women of the time were not just on the margins, but central to the gospel and the ministry of Jesus. Mary becomes the first witness of the risen Lord and an example of power and strength to all of us who want to be disciples. Welcome, Janice Johnson, to the Magnify podcast. Janice, we are so grateful that you're here with us today. Thanks. It's good to be here. Before we begin... I heard that before you came to Desert Book, you were a research professor. What did you study? So I study American religious history. I got a master's in history and then went to divinity school and and then worked for the church for a while and then got a PhD. So it's been lots of circles on the path. I know you've studied women in the scriptures. Can you tell me why the Savior thought it was so important to bring women into his circle? Yeah, definitely. And all of the Gospels are consistent that a significant part of those disciples who followed Jesus were women. And we have women who are financially supporting him, um, who are making it possible for him to have a ministry, who are following. And at the time in the first century, men and women did not operate in kind of joint private situations very often. If he's actually going to reach women, he needs women to help him in that to to be able so that his message can reach women. And I know we're going to discuss Mary Magdalene today, but before we get into that, can you help us distinguish between the Marys? Because I know that some of it has been a little intertwined with Pope Gregory, and this isn't history we necessarily need to get into, but there's... (laughs) Yeah. And it's hard. And in the first century, it was hard. Like, I've seen accounts that like half of the women in the first century are named Mary, like (laughs) in this time period and in this specific place in the Holy Land. Like, this is Mary is the most common possible name that we can get. And we don't always know which Mary we're talking about because sometimes we get specific distinctions. But we're not sure. So we start out with Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have uh, Mary called the Magdalene. We have Mary, who is also maybe called Salome. We've got, let's see, who else? We've got Mary of Bethany, which some have argued is Mary Magdalene, but that's another. But we've got so many Marys. And each gospel isn't consistent in how they name the Marys. And so that that makes this hard because we always have just part of the story. But we're introduced to Mary Magdalene in Luke 8. She is Mary called the Magdalene. And we get this description that out of whom went seven devils. Now, the Pope Gregory thing, I think that I think it is important that we talk about this because of Pope Gregory. <laughs> And he's not the first one. He's the second person to do this. But his narrative seems to take hold amongst Christianity. And he gives an Easter sermon in, I think, the early 6th century. 
And he conflates the woman in Luke 7 who comes to Simon's house when Jesus is there. Luke 7, 37 introduces us to her, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. And here we have this woman who's juxtaposed with Simon. Simon is the Pharisee. Jesus is having dinner in his home. And Simon is all worked up that this woman bathes Jesus's feet with her tears and then anoints his feet. And Jesus says, look, her sins, she may have many, but she's been forgiven. And she loved much. And I think that we also learn a lot by what we call different stories. And I don't know what we call this story in the Bible very often, but I like to call it the story of the woman who loved much. Now, that was not the way that Gregory told the story. Gregory focused on the fact that she was a woman of the city. He calls her a prostitute. And then he conflates this woman, this So what if she was a sinner? She's been forgiven. She started a new life. She is a different person now. And she loves Jesus. And that's the most important thing. And that's what I seem to get out of Luke 7. But for Gregory, he conflates this woman and Mary the Magdalene, who we are introduced to in the next chapter. And he says that they're the same woman rather than these two accounts being of two different women. And so one, it is besmirching this woman who has been forgiven of her sins. And that's the most important thing. And she loves Jesus. That is the central message there. But he uses it also to, to denigrate Mary Magdalene. And a lot, some have speculated that is because of the power that Mary Magdalene had in the first century church. And Gregory the Great is not comfortable with that. But we have seen the effects of that through time. And one of the things that we've seen the effects is in how we think about her name. Now, Mary called the Magdalene. We for a long time, the assumption was this was a place. And it's a, place a little fishing can, village. A little fishing village called Magdala. Right. The problem is that was not called Magdala until the 6th century. Right. And it was a, pil- a place of pilgrimage where people would go actually to honor Mary the Magdalene. And so there wasn't such a place that existed in the 1st century. And there has been some really, just in the last couple of years, a number of articles, but one that I think is, that kind of reviews everything related to Mary Magdalene, everything we know, and I think very convincingly argues that this isn't a place name, but this is her nickname. This is her title. And Jesus likes to give people titles. We have Peter Cephas. The rock, rock. and we have this play on words that Jesus is doing with Peter as the rock. We have the sons of thunder. We've got John the beloved. We've got all these nicknames, and these scholars argue that Mary, that Magdalene is a better translation here would be Mary, the tower, or the toweress, if we want to make it feminine. That Mary is the tower or the magnified one. And I had actually forgotten about the magnified one, but I think that's that works so beautifully is <laughs> we're on the magnified podcast. Maybe that's a little bit on the nose, huh. but that these are that'll help us remember it, yeah. right? These are better translations for what Magdalene means, that it is talking about her stature. It's talking about who she was as one of Jesus's disciples. This tells us something about her certainty, her witness of Jesus, and her her central role as a disciple of Jesus. So how does knowing that history or that backstory of Mary, knowing about her name, knowing about what that means, how does that change or influence your view of her? 
For me, I think, A, it helps me just not skip over her and not skip over her witness and her importance. I think at the end of Jesus's life, we have that very clearly. We see this closeness. She shows up when Jesus is crucified. In all of the accounts, she is there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross. She is always there at the tomb, whether she is by herself or she is with others. When she is going to anoint his body and then has the first evidence that he's risen because there's a, an empty tomb, she is the one who runs. And I love that line. It's in John 20. She goes, and in John's account, it's just Mary by herself. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher. She sees the stone. It's moved away. And then I love the beginning of verse two, and then she runneth. (laughs) And for me, that is a model of discipleship. She sees and then she acts. And maybe our running is metaphorical. Maybe it is actual physical running. I think discipleship is going to make us tired, whether it is mentally or emotionally tired or physically tired. But discipleship is always going to involve running. There is this beautiful, actually this summer, I'm hoping to see it. I've only seen pictures of it. But this fountain that is in Bologna in in Italy, and it is Mary Magdalene running. (laughs) And there is this amazing movement and it is her running. And she runs to go and tell Peter and John that he's gone. And then John doesn't tell us, but she's got to be running back. And discipleship is always going to require running. That's always going to be an essential part of being a disciple. What a profound point. And I'm even looking at that verse in John chapter 20, verse one, where it says that she runs. And I think sometimes we skip over the part that she runs in the dark. (laughs) What do you think that tells us about her and about discipleship that sometimes we're running in the dark? I I think that I think it's a remarkable thing because she doesn't wait until it's easy to go. She knows that this is the most important thing and she just goes. And so she doesn't she's okay with the fact that maybe her journey is going to be a little more painful because she might trip over something. Huh. She might not see her way clearly. And yet she goes and then she gets this really important piece of information He's gone. There's either one or two angels there, depending on which account we go with. And he is, he's not there in the tomb. He's risen. And then she runs again. And she doesn't, oh, I'm going to wait until it's easier for me to run to make it to Peter Mm -hmm. and John. But she goes. And I think that immediacy is really significant. Like, do we take our time and do things at the time that's most convenient for us? Or do we do things? Because we feel compelled that they need to be done. Because the spirit prompts us that maybe we should do that thing in that moment, even though it's maybe not the easiest way for it to be done. Or even maybe we don't see the way that it is going to happen or unfold. I think sometimes stepping into the dark, right? We don't know the answer. We haven't received knowledge of what's going to happen. And sometimes I think just stepping into that dark, into that unknown and trust that he will light our way. Yeah. I think sometimes I, I think it was Elder Maxwell said, the Lord's not always going to light the whole path. He's just going to light as far as you need. <laughs> and just, it's just sometimes a step. we just get that. Yeah. Sometimes it is just the step and that requires a lot of faith. Like culturally, we really like those stories of certainty. Like I felt prompted to do something and I immediately changed someone's life for the better. I brought the brownies and it changed everything. And I think that those experiences are more the exception than Mm. the rule. Most of the time, we can't see it clearly. And even after we act, we don't necessarily know. Mary here, she acts She runs 
She runs back. She still doesn't know. She is left there at the empty tomb crying because she can't see anything. And Janice, can we just talk about that for just a moment as she is outside the tomb? And even in verse 11, I think one of the most powerful phrases to me, it says, but Mary stood. And as we talk about her being strength and a tower, that she stood in a place where she was unsure and uncertain and sorrowful and filled with great emotion. And what does that tell us about her and leading up into one of the most profound experiences I think we have in the scripture between Jesus and Mary? I, yeah, I love that moment too. Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. Now, I think without just tells us she's outside the sepulcher, but I also love that because she's without vision. She doesn't Mm -hmm. know what's happening and she is desperately sad. But she's still standing and she is there. She stays. She stands and she witnesses and she is still and she becomes the first witness of the risen Lord. And she is told to go tell the apostles. She's an apostle to the apostles. Yeah. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, she is the apostle to the apostles. And I think that she is a really remarkable example of discipleship. And if we think about definitions, like a disciple is a self-appointed follower. (sighs) We decide if we're going to be disciples of Christ. And she had decided that a long time ago. And as I think about my own discipleship, I want to be that person who follows what the Spirit's telling me, who maybe speaks out when I'm not going to be believed, or who finds that right moment but does those things that God has asked me to do. Or stays still when it's hard and painful to stay still. Yeah. And I see all these pictures of the women at the cross and they're fainting. And that is not how I picture Mary. And in fact, when we look at this account of them at the cross, there is Mary, there are the women who are there. It is the women who stand unflinching who are gritty and tough. And that's how I see Mary Magdalene standing and staying at the crucifixion when it must have been so painful and so hard. And yet we see her toughness. We see how gritty she is. And I just think we can, we have to paint ourselves into this story. We have to be able to see ourselves in the life of the savior and as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Mary is such a profound example of being a witness of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you, how does her example help you become a stronger witness of Jesus Christ? I think that one, it reminds me that we all have different gifts, but women are some of the most important witnesses we have of Christ. We learn this also early in the Restoration. The Lord gives Emma a commandment to expound and exhort and expounding scripture. Exhorting is like sharing testimony. We certainly get that from Mary Magdalene. And expounding scripture is sharing what she's learned. And Emma gets that direction, but it becomes something in the Relief Society for years when the Relief Society gets to Utah, they keep reading those verses because they say, okay, this is how women are supposed to function in the restoration. And I see these examples of discipleship that it involves speaking up and speaking out, even when it's hard. It involves following the spirit. It involves doing those things to develop my relationship so I'm a better disciple with Christ. For me, that's always focused on scriptures and service and how I'm responding to those nudges that I get from the Spirit. So studying her life, studying these scriptures, knowing the history, what has she taught you about the Savior and about your relationship with him? I believe Mary's word. I believe that he lives, that he not only was resurrected, 
and now can offer eternal life to all of us. But I believe that he knows me and he knows my sadness and he knows my joys. And he, in a very real way, knows what I need because he chose to experience to suffer those afflictions and temptations and hard things that I experience in mortality. And he knows how to help me and he wants to help me and he will help me if I turn to him. I have to decide to turn to him and to let my heart go to him, but it comes and he will respond. Not always in the time, sometimes there's silence when I would really rather direct input, <laughs> but eventually it, it comes. I have learned so much from this conversation and I just am thinking about how I can be a tower, how I can be a stronger disciple of Jesus Christ. And what would your small and simple challenge be so that we, like Mary, can be personal witnesses of Jesus Christ? I think particularly as we're approaching Easter and we have this moment, Elder Stevenson has asked us to really focus on Easter and take advantage of what Easter can offer us, can teach us. And as we are studying the life of the Savior, that we take that time to, to think about what that means and how we can better testify. Maybe that's going to be in our actions. Maybe that's going to be in pushing a little more when we run <laughs> to, to help someone or to do something important as we're on the Lord's errand. But thinking about that idea of being a tower, being one who epitomizes this devotion and this strength that comes from being a disciple of Christ. And I think for each of us, it's going to look a little bit differently. But I think that as we really focus on Easter and focus on the Savior, that the Spirit will tell us, maybe nudge us just a little bit on those things that we need to work on, or something that we can say, or those small ways that uh, that we can maybe stand a little bit taller and be a, a, a stronger witness of Christ. I like how you said that the spirit can nudge us of what we can do. And hopefully as we're listening to this, something will pop into our mind of a way that we can stand a little taller or be a witness. I know I've had a couple of things pop into my mind and have you had something that's popped into your mind during this conversation? Yeah. I, I've had one just on the edge of my mind, but one of my ministering sisters is in a rehab center right now, and she's also kind of has dementia. And so I try to go see her about once a week while she's yeah. there in this place. But it's hard because we have the same conversation every time I go. I don't really know how well she's doing because she tells me the same thing every time. She tells me the same stories. But yet, I know that this is something that I need to be consistent oh. with. And I didn't, like, I've been her ministering sister for months and didn't get, actually get to meet her because she has a gate around her house and never picked up the phone or responded to my texts <laughs> before. So these are like the first, and I have no idea if once she's back in her home, she's going to even recognize me, but it's this little moment that I feel like I need to take advantage of. Anyway, it's just an interesting thing. Even if she doesn't remember, it still matters. Janice, thank you so much for your insights and your thoughts. And we would love to hear other people's little nudge of what they feel inspired to do to stand a little taller and to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Thanks. I'm excited to see what other people feel nudged to do. It's good to be with you all. Make a mental note that new Magnify podcasts drop on Tuesdays. This is one way we're gathering and empowering Latter-day Saint women to be a significant force for good. 
And we'd love it if you would just hit that subscribe button on your way out. Thanks for being a part of us.